Concussion Legacy Foundation New York Advisory Board members Leslie and David Capel here. David works as an attorney in the real estate business, and he also ran a youth hockey travel association for seven years. Leslie is a licensed clinical social worker with a private psychotherapy practice in the city. And the Capels are part of this webinar because of their son, Adam. Adam suffered a series of four concussions in four years and was forced to retire from hockey when he was 17. Uh, I've known the Capels for a very long time. You know, Adam's also spent some time with us up in Boston. Great young man who had just graduated from the University of Virginia, and so he's doing so much better. And part of this, we picked these parents is because their children aren't doing so well. And Adam, you've got involved with us uh, to help raise awareness for concussion safety and prevention. And he even fundraises $15,000 to help advance some of our research and treatments for PCS and CTE. So with that, let's bring in David and Leslie. Hi. How are you doing? Good. There you are. Can you see How are you guys? Up? I can see both of you. It's, it's, yes, I, I like, I, I can't believe you're in different places. You're on the beach right now? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> I wish. Yeah. We're, we're working uh, remotely from different rooms in our, in our same home, so. Yes, I love it. The new fun. world is so fun. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you guys for being here. You know, I've got to know you over the years because of Adam's amazing story, and you guys have a lot of lessons to share too. And what's, what's interesting, it, it was sort of the first thing when I talked to you both about what would you pass on, you wanted to talk about school because I think what the parents here are, are sort of learning is that some parents here are finding their schools helpful and some parents here are finding their school may not be well educated, especially if yours is the first uh, child to go through it. So can you tell me what's your advice, what your experience was and what your advice is for parents in dealing with school? Sure. Well, Barbara um, covered a little bit of this, so it was a nice segue, actually, that you are your child's best advocate and you know your child better than anyone. Um, and I don't know if it's so black and white. Schools are either good or bad. It's just that even the most intelligent people don't understand what a concussion is and what the long-term or even short-term effects are. So. I think our, our kids were at a great school. Adam was at a fabulous school. Um, the support and the compassion were there, and yet then they weren't. <laughs> so, you know, oh, we understand that it's really hard. What can we do? And even with doctor's notes and phone calls from Chris, um, there, there still seemed to be this misperception that there's a timeline. There's a certain amount of time that can pass and after a few days um, you're, you're back. Um, and that was tricky because your child might feel better after a few days and then goes to read an assignment or write a paper and that's when it all starts crashing again and it sort of just cycles out of control that way. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why Adam did get so involved as an ambassador raising funds because he was dying to bring you, Chris, to his school because he felt like nobody understood him. And teachers would say, of course, you know, don't do any work. It's fine. And then a week or two later, well, you're going to have to make all this up. Right. And you have a child who's already suffering from anxiety about the concussion feeling the effects of the concussion and then being told that they're going to have to basically do, do double the amount of work in half the amount of time as everyone else. So that was very confusing. And Barbara had said, like, that's our job as parents and you know your child. So I never had a lazy child. I still don't have a lazy child. I don't have a child who's looking to take the easy way out and say, let me lie in bed and not, not do my work. Um, so you have to know your child and you have to keep on the teachers and the school and whatever you need to do to make sure that they're okay. And, and tell me about what that how advocating for them in school actually became. So who, who would you talk to? How would you engage them? How would you get them to do the right thing? Oh, well, 
you, you don't know me that well, Chris. <laughs> It's, uh, you don't want to be on the other side of my phone calls, okay? <laughs> um, when it comes to, and, and I'm sure anyone watching, when it comes to your child. So there's no, there's no easy answer for that because I probably called everyone in the school, you know, starting with, so Adam was at boarding school. So you call the doctor um, at, the, at the school, he's on board. You speak to the nurses, they're on board. You speak to your child's advisor, they seem to understand speak to each teacher individually, uh, you name it, uh, people in the dining hall to, to make sure that Adam could eat without it being too noisy. I'm talking, you call everyone you can. So that's, I guess, the lesson that um, what we didn't follow was, we're, we're gonna handle it, don't worry, we're taking care of it. And it's a fabulous school, I am not saying it's not, this will happen everywhere you are the one who has to lead that, that ship. Yeah, no, that's great advice. David, you want anything to add there? Can I ask you about coaches? You can ask me about coaches. So how did Adam's coaches respond and what did you learn from that you'd want to share? Well, as Leslie said, when you came to Adam's school to speak, what was uh, amazing to me was how few coaches were there. This was an absolute great opportunity to, for them to hear from the expert about concussions. And in a school with probably 35 or 40 varsity sports over the different seasons, I think there might have been three to five, one of which was not the hockey coach, which, you know, just it, it told all for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of the coaches are just unaware. Um, that's, that's why one of your programs is Speak Out, Stand Out, um, I can't remember. Team Up, Speak Up. Team Up, yes. Speak Up. The other players might know that a player is hurting where a coach is standing behind him. All he can see is the back of his helmet and they can't see his eyes. Yeah. But um, coaches don't, I shouldn't say coaches don't. A lot <laughs> of coaches don't um, pick up the signals, don't look for the signals. Um, they can be numb to it sometimes. Uh, Adam played in a tournament once. He got a concussion in the first game, and the coach let him play three more games over a weekend. And we then, and, and then when yeah. Leslie when Leslie called him, uh, like on Wednesday of the following week, you know he was absolutely clueless that Adam was in bad shape. It was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean it's fair to say, uh, you know that. You don't, you don't want to pick on coaches, but it's important to talk about the data. And the data, the Aspen Institute publishes data every year on coach concussion training. And so for everyone in the audience, it's important to know that probably only, depending on your sport, 30 to 40% of coaches have had any formal concussion training. Even though it's supposed to be mandated, uh, it's supposed to be the CDC online training, which I've tried the voiceover for, most people haven't seen it. So I think your experience um, of finding coaches who didn't have training and didn't have perspective is common and so how did you how did you start to turn that around well we had to like leslie advocated in, in front of the the school the academic side we had to get in the coaches faces and make sure they understood what they needed to look for um not all of them understand that and just you know that's just not my job some sometimes you get that kind of an attitude it's very upsetting um you know even Back 10, 12 years ago, USA Hockey in their coaching seminars, there was no section on concussions. I did all that training um, as part of running the organization and all the way up through uh, high school hockey coaching, there was no section on concussions. I don't know if that's changed now. I've been out of the That has world. changed. They've actually been a great partner on Team Up Speak Up. We have a USA Hockey Week. But yeah, yeah it, it, it's taken time. But it, it wasn't I also like that. Want, I, I want to just add that, you know, have, I, I, having a competitive um, athletic background David has with hockey, I have with tennis, they're like, reason seems to go out the window. So the coaches may even have a little bit of that training and understanding, but when the game is, is tied and, you know, just a few minutes yeah. left, they want to put their best player back in. And, and right. oh, he's fine. He, you know, brush it off. He's fine. 
or like, oh, he's talking now, he's okay. And they put him back in. So sometimes that's the mentality, um, which makes it even more challenging. Yeah, so yeah, I assume your suggestion would be, if you're gonna put your child's going back to sports, you wanna make sure that your coaches are educated uh, if, they, if they aren't at a place where you feel comfortable. Correct. And that's yeah. part of what organization you let your child play Yeah, is part of. That, that's, um, a, that's a great point. Um, all right. So you've also talked about, uh, and, and Leslie, with your professional background, you probably have a lot to say on this. So anxiety and depression are common symptoms, of concussion, and they, they can be difficult for children to cope with and manage. And then when you add a concussion to that, it can make them worse. So how did you manage the emotional side? of the injury? Um, well, the first thing that you mentioned I, it is something, believe it or not, even professionally, I didn't know until Adam had his concussion. And so I learned, and I think this is important for parents, that if your child has any underlying, I mean, who doesn't have anxiety about any, right? We all have some anxiety to some extent. Um, it seems to be exasperated after a concussion. So those symptoms that might have been mild that you could overlook, a, a child being afraid to be alone in a dark room or go to sleep at night or things like that, um, those are small signs of anxiety. And after concussion, uh, anxiety really flares up and depression, which is you know anxiety turning inward towards the self. So those things were very scary for me to see. And it was really helpful to hear from the neurologist that it's very common with a predisposition to anxiety, this will flare up much, you know, much more obviously. So that was challenging. Um, I, and I think in terms of, so getting Adam some therapy and Barbara had talked about this for her daughter too, it w was key. And um, because Adam was living in his own head, right? He's living in his head, losing his sport, losing his edge academically, uh, not being able to be a social and be around loud noises and, and then having anxiety and even more depression, it sort of just keeps cycling or circling around. And so it's very helpful for your child to have someone neutral to talk to other than mom and dad, even if mom is in the biz, um, to, yeah. to let them know that what they're feeling is completely normal because that can take away some of the anxiety. Adam was starting to think like, what's wrong with me? And am I ever going to feel normal again? So going to have someone to talk to, to hear someone else say, this is very common what you're going through. Tell me your fears and let's, let's deal with each one and let's focus on what we can right now. And uh, mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, uh, different uh, CDs or, or uh, playlists that Adam listened to were really helpful about calming and some of these new apps that we didn't have then are fabulous. Mm. Yeah, it, 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 that's a great point. It's worth, it's worth saying again, you know, because I'm sure, you know, half the parents watching right now are concerned about their child's depression or anxiety. And, and it's important to know that's, that is normal and it's common when you have a brain injury. And it will, it is temporary, but you know, you have to be vigilant on teaching, learning how to take care of it. That could be talking to somebody else. I think what you mentioned with apps and everything, it's all, it's all very important. And, and right. so and, I think- And when anyone has a, a bout of anxiety or depression, when you're in that, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So it's very scary. So adding insult to injury, to me, that was one of the things that concerned me the most, seeing my happy-go-lucky, life of the party, smiling, upbeat, positive kid, just being someone different. Barbara mentioned seeing Esther and not having that same light in her eye. Same thing. So when yeah. you see that parents know that that is, that can be quite common and, and it's okay. It, I always say this, I say it at my private practice and I say it to my kids and to David, that is a, it is a sign of strength to be able to say, we need to get a little bit of help with this. It is not a sign of weakness. It's weakness to think that you can conquer everything by yourself. So it's a sign of strength. Even if you're not a believer in therapy, get your kids some therapy. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and, and then there's the, the other part of it is sometimes it can be elevated to a crisis level when you're dealing with depression, anxiety. So we did a webinar last week. We'll put it in the chat now. You can find that on our website um, where we talked to the head of the NFL Lifeline and the psychiatrist about how to deal with that. So we won't cover that here, but that is an important thing when you talk about anxiety and depression. Sometimes it can go really to, to a bad place. It's important to be trained to know how to assess that. The way they talked about last week was you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're calling 911 all the time because then your parent, your kid might stop, might stop talking to you, right? And so, and telling you what's going on. So important to know when is it normal to talk about some of these depression issues and other things and when do you start to be concerned and maybe bring in professional support. Right. I don't, want to I don't that. know if, if this, this is something that you've covered then, but I think it's worth mentioning because I would think a lot of parents have, um, well, you probably have a full range of ages, but so Adam had his concussion in his high school years and then went off to college. And even though um, the drinking age is 21, we know what goes on in college. Mm -hmm. So we saw a resurgence when Adam uh, would go to a party and maybe be sleep deprived and, and uh, maybe partake in things that he shouldn't have. Um, but that seemed to make it worse too. And that's a real big challenge because your child is going off to college and wants to be normal, but those normal things can really trigger the anxiety and depression all over again. Yeah, that's a good point. And so I want to wrap up with one, one last area that when we talked to you before, I was so interested to hear. And that's, we, you know, with, with Barbara, we mentioned sort of the impact on the family, but with PCS, but now I want to talk about the impact between family members. So you guys had sort of a fun little experience um, in how Adam's injury impacted your marriage. So can you tell me about that and how you would advise other, parent, other parents about that? Well, I'll start and David could finish, but <laughs> we are in different rooms right now only because we're working in different rooms, but we have had a very solid marriage 26 years and counting, and always communicated super well, and only argued in two arenas. One in the car, <laughs> and the other was when Adam got his concussion. And we were not on the same page. And um, I think, again, Barbara touched upon this, where it's hard for some parents who have hopes and dreams either for being watching their child or hopes and dreams that they had for themselves and they want their child to follow along in their footsteps. And so David and I did not agree on the protocol for what Adam should do. I was more from the school of, okay, you have a lot of other wonderful things in your life. Like let's focus on that. And it was a little harder for David. So um, that was that was a challenge. David, would you like to? Oh, David, I feel like we should hear your side of the story here. Yes. Uh, it, it was a challenge and I wasn't ready. And I think Barbara's husband might've been more, more proactive in this. I wasn't ready for Adam's career to be over. And I think there's probably most parents who have nurtured their kids and work with them don't want to see it end. And we all know it ends at some point, you know, not everyone gets the NHL or even plays college hockey, but I was having a hard time letting it go. And Leslie was probably telling me all the right things, but I couldn't hear them. And then we went to a neurologist here in the city who is a wonderful neurologist, but at the end of the visit, he started talking about when Adam could start exercising again and, um, you know, return to play protocols. And I said to him, are you saying that he can start playing hockey again? He said, well, I'm not really saying that. I'm not suggesting that he does, but that's your decision. And so Leslie heard one thing, hockey's over. And I heard, oh, well, there's a chance that he'll play again. And that's when we reached out and, and met Bob Cantu for the first time. And he was very clear, sit out for a year and then come back and see me and I'll talk to you again. But in the meantime, no hockey. And um, it, it, that made it even worse for us because I heard, oh yeah, return to play. And Leslie heard he shouldn't play again. And so it, it caused a little bit of acrimony and you know, I was, it took me a while to get on board. Let's put it that way. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you know, we were we were we were bristling, uh, you know, around the house because Leslie is very um, adamant and headstrong, and I'm very adamant and headstrong, and so neither one of us was giving each other an inch, and it became difficult. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't. Uh, yeah. You know, how did you difficult. fix it? Yeah, I mean, how did how, how did you get through? What's your advice of well, parents? I think I think right once now? we got some clear advice from from Bob, who told us this is the protocol, this is what you're going to do, um, and this is what is should be done. I said, okay, this is the expert, and this is the second opinion, and he said, sit out a year, and then we went back to, and so that was it. He was out. We went back to him a year later. He said, look, it's not a red light; it's a flashing yellow light. And, you know, you can return to play. I don't recommend it. And so, of course, I heard can return to play. He returned to play. He played three or four months, got another concussion, and that was it. Yeah. So. I mean, we, uh, we, you know, it, our method might not work for everyone because I basically told David that, okay, you, you can have it your way and Adam could start playing over my dead and divorced body. So... <laughs> Uh, you know, yep, I, that'll I do know. it. It was, it was really bristling is a lovely word, honey, but I'm not sure that. that <laughs> but and you make you make a good point, though. I think we've talked about before, though. You don't always get a definitive answer from a doctor, and that's difficult because they're supposed to be the medical expert. But there's so much more wrapped up in the decision about walking away from sports, and so that's why I usually tell everyone go see Dr. Cantu, let him tell you what you what you think, but also. Yeah, we should probably do another webinar on retiring from sports because it is such a complicated decision. Right. Yeah. That would be a very good topic. Yeah. But all right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out and sharing your life with us and your experience. It's really, it was really helpful.